such an honor to be here with you, Vandana Shiva, Dr. Shiva. Um, we are here today because of the hearings going on for the People's Tribunal in Oaxaca on genetically modified corn. And proponents of genetically modified crops claim that genetically modified crops, or GMOs, solve world hunger by allowing farmers to produce more food on their land while conserving water and energy. And Monsanto claims to be a sustainable agriculture com company. Can you share your critiques of GMOs and of the Green Revolution and what you instead find to be a truly sustainable path for feeding the planet? Um, GMOs fit into an industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture must by necessity be based on monocultures. And we've always been told this produces more food. But if you do a calculation, rough calculation, probably the Midwest of the US produces four tons of maize. But here in Oaxaca, the maize with the beans, with the squash, with the bananas, with the mangoes, and all the other foods would produce about 10 tons. So it's 10 tons more or four tons more? And don't we need diversity in our diet? That has been established. Genetic engineering in any case does not increase the yields in that monoculture system because the yields are determined by the plant into which the genetic engineering is introduced. And the only two genes that they have managed to commercialize, a Bt toxic gene and a Roundup resistant gene, now these genes don't add to the weight of a corn crop. They add to the toxic in the corn crop. So it's a lie to say we are increasing food production. But most importantly, an industrial agriculture system into which the GMOs are fitting and which the GMOs are accelerating is part of a commodity production system. It's not a food system. It should not be called food. Only 10% of the corn is being eaten by human beings. The rest is going to drive cars, produce ethanol, because that's where the big subsidies are. And a large part is going for animal feed. I don't call it feed because herbivores were meant to eat grass, not the grain. Humans ate the grain, the cows ate the grass. And we had a perfectly harmonious relationship. Now, if only 10% of what they're growing is going for human food, how on earth can they say they are addressing hunger. In fact, since transgenics came into food systems, the access to food has actually gone down because the production has gone down, uh, the diversity has gone down, but most importantly, the human component of this industrial commodity system has gone down. As you have shown, corporate seed and chemical fertilizer created a cycle of debt, leading to vast numbers of farmer suicides in India. Can you compare the struggles against GMO and for free and natural seed that are going on now in India and in Mexico, and what we can learn from these together? Well, you know, across the world, there is only one struggle now. And that one struggle is for life on Earth, including human life. But it doesn't mean life on Earth for just one crop. It means every aspect of life. After all, the web of life is a food web. And that food web connects all of life. The fight against transgenic corn here in Mexico is the same fight as ours against transgenic cotton, which has locked our farmers into debt and pushed them to suicide. We've lost 270,000 farmers in a land where we don't believe this life is the only life. We believe in um, other lives after. You never gave up with that idea that this life is just passing. You never gave up. But farmers are giving up because the agents of Monsanto, the seed and chemical agents, basically sell the seed on credit against land. And they have nothing to lose because when the farmer can't pay, they become bigger and bigger landowners against the law of the land. There is not supposed to be money lending. It's illegal in India. But the agents of these companies are the new money lenders because they say, take it. And when the farmer realizes he's going to lose his land, he drinks pesticide and ends his life. Now, 270,000 is a genocide. And absolutely the same will happen here in Mexico if transgenic maize takes over. Because not only will 
the diversity of maize go, not only will there be contamination, but Monsanto sells transgenic seeds for only one reason, to collect royalties from the seed. They want to be the new life lords on the planet. They collect 200 million from cotton in India. 2.2 billion is the case of Brazilian peasants on the soya royalties against Monsanto. Now, since Mexico is such a big eater of corn and grower of corn, can you imagine how much royalty they would collect with all the corn being transgenic? And you don't just get a push for transgenics. Um, it always comes with a criminalization of local indigenous seed in the name of it being not good enough, when it is the only good seed worthy of growing and worthy of eating. Everything industry has done with the green revolution, with genetic engineering, is how to make seed more toxic, either by breeding for higher response to chemical, which is what Summit did, Iri did. That's all they did. They pushed, they were drug pushers of a different kind. And just like the drug cartels are killing people today, these cartels are killing people across the world. The Mexican peasant will be wiped out, but the Mexican peasant doesn't just have a right to livelihood for themselves. They don't just have a right to their culture of corn. They are vital to a culture of a living seed for the world. And that's why I've come all the way from India. Because for me, defending the life in the seed is defending our life for the future. Despite widespread popular opposition and increasing popular organization, governments and corporations around the world continue to impose genetically modified seed on the people, and GMOs are increasing in prevalence and scope. In the face of the seeming power asymmetry between governments and corporations on the one hand and ordinary people on the other hand, what do we need to be doing and what do we need to understand and learn from each other and from diverse struggles in order to transform these dynamics and restore a sustainable and non-exploitative world? Well, you know, when in 1987 I heard these companies talk about introducing GMOs in order to patent seed and using the WTO and GATT to push this around the world, uh, that's when I started to save seed. But at that point they had said by the year 2000, all seed would be GMO. They had talked about five companies controlling the food supply of the world. We are in 2013. There are few countries where GMOs have spread. Most countries are GMO free. Most crops are GMO free. So in fact, we should recognize the power of movements for having stopped it so far. When uh, in 2003, President Bush wanted to impose GMOs on Europe, we organized a global citizens campaign and told the WTO we're watching. We were going to watch your decision. 30 million signatures were given to WTO. And they were forced to not give a judgment in favor of Monsanto to push GMOs. Um, Monsanto got in illegally with cotton. I fought them. Four years they couldn't sell commercially. But they tried again with the eggplant, which is, has evolved in India. It like corn is your, uh, you know, the center of diversity for corn is Mexico, the center of diversity for brinjal. Uh, for eggplant is India, uh, and we mobilized. There's a moratorium. They haven't been able to bring the eggplant. We are now mobilizing against the craziness of a GM banana with 0.44 milligrams of iron when we have foods with 60 milligrams of iron. So we are talking about something like a 1,200% inefficiency in the GM technologies. Um, so what do we need to do? I think most movements have been de dealing only with their national governments. And my large movements have been thinking it's a problem with their national government. Thinking every other government is clean, no government is clean. The worst is the United States government, which makes no decision for its own people. It allows Monsanto to write the laws. It allows Monsanto to undermine labeling laws. It enables Monsanto to sue governments that do something simple which should be a pillar of democracy, the right to know what you're eating. And I don't think the US deserves to be called a democracy anymore because their citizens don't have the right to know what they're eating. They don't have a right to choose what they're eating. Democracy begins with what makes us. Food is what makes us. We are what we eat. And if even on that the freedom is taken away, governments should not pretend they're making democratic decisions. 
I think the next step is exactly what we are building. That's why I've traveled. That's why we build the Global Citizens Campaign on Seed Freedom. I think we need to do three things simultaneously. We need to deepen our struggles locally while connecting globally. This is a global struggle. Secondly, we need to, with one hand, plant the local seed, and with the other hand, keep the transgenics out. It's one struggle. They're not two separate struggles. We've been too specialized. You know, they're the GMO fighters, the seed savers. And when we started the seed freedom campaign, it was to put it all together. We said, no, 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 no. There isn't a community of seed savers that just does it for itself. And there isn't a community of fighters against GMOs that just says no to GMOs. Seed saving is fighting GMOs. Fighting GMOs becomes the place where you realize native seed, open pollinated seed, free seed is the only kind of food we can grow. The third thing that is extremely vital is the kind of process that's taking place here with the uh, pre-hearings for the Permanent People's Tribunal. Um, I appeared for one of the early ones against the World Bank. That's when World Bank was named as a destroyer of the planet. And I was asked to appear as nature. Now, basically, Monsanto's taking over by hijacking law. But law comes from society. When criminals write the law, it's criminal law. It's law against nature, it's law against people, it's law against culture. And what's happening here is saying we will create our own jurisprudence. We are now drafting a law of the seed. We are saying Monsanto's intellectual property rights in WTO is illegal, illegitimate. It was to be reviewed in 1999. The government said there should be no patents on seed. Complete that review. Monsanto says, we invented the seed, sorry. It's been around for millennia. Yeah? Go home with your toxics and don't pretend to be the creator. We joke and say GMOs, in fact, could mean God moved over. And the God could be the seed itself, creation in all its diversity. You choose your God. I think we reached the time where citizens have to reclaim their commons. And I think in Mexico, there's a dual challenge. All of the problems started with undoing the most enlightened system of collective ownership of land, land as a commons. After all, the earth can only be looked after when we collectively take responsibility. But while we reclaim the land as a commons and communal, we need to reclaim seed as a commons. So we're writing a new law of the seed that comes from seed. The seed tells us, I want to multiply, I want to be shared. The law of the seed is saving and sharing is your right and your duty. It can't be criminalized. No intellectual property stands in that law. Um, in any case, the science they've used to do all this, the improved seed for which native seeds must disappear, the GMOs for which native seeds uh, disappear, is not just a primitive science, it's now becoming a falsified science. Breeding is not for uniformity. Uniformity is a sure way to create food insecurity and huge vulnerability, particularly in times of climate change. We need to breed for diversity. The criteria of DUS is wrong. We need, which is distinctiveness, uniformity, stability, on the basis of which they recognize seed and therefore criminalize local seed through compulsory registration. We are saying we. Farmers have always bred for resilience, for diversity, and for quality. And the more corporations breed, the more they take quality out of food. The food becomes more and more tasteless. It becomes non-food, anti-food. Seed becomes anti-seed. A terminator seed is the opposite of what seed should be. So we need to start rewriting our own laws. But to do this, we have to have the courage and the solidarity to know that ultimately the power is ours. What are five corporations in the face of 300 million species? What are five corporations in the face of seven million people? And even if you assume only half are active, that's still a lot. Of course, one of the final things in this strategy for defending our seed freedom has to be taking lessons from Gandhi. Gandhi in 1909, wrote a book on freedom. And it is a text for freedom in India. But he wrote it in South, while traveling from England to South Africa. 
non-stop he wrote because he was absolutely passionate about freedom and he said as long as the superstition exists that unjust law must be obeyed so long with slavery exist. What we are seeing with transgenics and patents is a new slavery of people, of farmers, of citizens, of all life on earth. The new liberation is to recognize that these laws cannot be cooperated with because they're higher laws of ecology, of the earth, of ethics, of solidarity, of justice, of democracy that have to be obeyed. And if we unify worldwide to celebrate our diversity, to announce that yes, you've been powerful before. There was a pathetic little man called Hitler. Where is he now? And you, Monsanto, are the new Hitler. More vicious, more dangerous, but you will go like Hitler went.